podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on social media and wherever you listen to podcasts. Our current goal is to get to 100 written reviews on the podcast's app to help new listeners find us. If you haven't subscribed and written a review yet, please do. We get closer to our goal every week. And dear listeners, your reviews amaze us and we learn from your feedback. So thank you for taking the time to share. This episode is brought to you by Lucky Goldfish in a Koi Pond. Tonight, we'll be reading the opening chapters to Dr. Doolittle, written in 1920 by British author Hugh Lofting, the full title being The Story of Dr. Doolittle, being the history of his peculiar life at home and astonishing adventures in foreign parts. It is the first of Lofting's Dr. Doolittle books, a series of children's novels about a man who learns to talk to animals and becomes their champion around the world. It was one of the novels in the series which was adapted into the 1967 film, Dr. Doolittle. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Story of Dr. Doolittle. Once upon a time, many years ago, when our grandfathers were little children, there was a doctor, and his name was Doolittle. John Doolittle, M.D. M.D. means that he was a proper doctor and knew a whole lot. He lived in a little town called Puddleby on the Marsh. All the folks, young and old, knew him well by sight. And wherever he walked down the street in his high hat, everyone would say, There goes the doctor. He's a clever man. And the dogs and the children would all run up and follow behind him. And even the crows that lived in the church tower would caw and nod their heads. The house he lived in, on the edge of the town, was quite small, but his garden was very large and had a wide lawn and stone seats and weeping willows hanging over. His sister, Sarah Doolittle, was housekeeper for him, but the doctor looked after the garden himself. He was very fond of animals and kept many kinds of pets. Besides the goldfish in the pond at the bottom of his garden, he had rabbits in the pantry, white mice in his piano, a squirrel in the linen closet, and a hedgehog in the cellar. He had a cow with a calf, too, and an old lame horse, 25 years of age, and chickens and pigeons and two lambs, and many other animals. But his favorite pets were Dab Dab the duck, Jip the dog, Gub Gub the baby pig, Polynesia the parrot, and the owl, Too Too. His sister used to grumble about all of these animals and said they made the house untidy. And one day, When an old lady with rheumatism came to see the doctor, she sat on the hedgehog who was sleeping on the sofa and never came to see him anymore, but drove every Saturday all the way to Oxenthorpe, another town ten miles off, 
to see a different doctor, and she never came to see him anymore. Then his sister, Sarah Doolittle, came to him and said, John, how can you expect sick people to come and see you when you keep all these animals in the house? It's a fine doctor would have his parlor full of hedgehogs and mice. That's the fourth personage these animals have driven away. Squire Jenkins and the parson say they wouldn't come near your house again, no matter how sick they are. We are getting poorer every day. If you go on like this, none of the best people will have you for a doctor. But I like the animals better than the best people, said the doctor. You are ridiculous, said his sister, and walked out of the room. So, as time went on, the doctor got more and more animals, and the people who came to see him got less and less, till at last he had no one left except the cat's meat man, who didn't mind any kind of animals. But the cat's meat man wasn't very rich, and he only got sick once a year, at Christmas time, when he used to give the doctor sixpence for a bottle of medicine. Sixpence a year wasn't enough to live on, even in those days, long ago. And if the doctor hadn't had some money saved up in his money box, no one knows what would have happened. And he kept on getting still more pets. And of course, it cost a lot to feed them. And the money he had saved up grew littler and littler. Then he sold his piano and let the mice live in a bureau drawer. But the money he got for that too began to go. So he sold the brown suit he wore on Sundays and went on becoming poorer and poorer. And now, when he walked down the street in his high hat, people would say to one another, there goes John Doolittle, M.D. There was a time when he was the best known doctor in the West Country. Look at him now. He hasn't any money and his stockings are full of holes. But the dogs and the cats and the children still ran up and followed him through the town, the same as they had done when he was rich. Chapter 2 Animal Language It happened one day that the doctor was sitting in his kitchen talking with the cat's meat man who had come to see him with a stomach ache. Why don't you give up being a people's doctor and be an animal doctor? asked the cat's meat man. The parrot, Polynesia, was sitting in the window looking out at the rain and singing a sailor song to herself. She stopped singing and started to listen. You see, doctor, the cat's meat man went on. You know all about animals, much more than what these here vets do. That book you wrote about cats? Why, it's wonderful. I can't read or write myself. Or maybe I'd write some books. But my wife, Theodosia, she's a scholar, she is. And she read your book to me. Well, it's wonderful. That's all can be said. Wonderful. You might have been a cat yourself. You know the way they think. And listen, you can make a lot of money doctoring animals. Do you know that? You see, I'd send all the old women who had sick cats or dogs to you. And if they didn't get sick fast enough, I could put something in the meat I sell. Make them sick, see? Oh no, said the doctor quickly. You mustn't do that. That wouldn't be right. 
Oh, I didn't mean real sick, answered the cat's meat man. Just a little something to make them droopy-like was what I had reference to. But, as you say, maybe it ain't quite fair on the animals. But they'll get sick anyway, because the old women always give them too much to eat. And look, all the farmers around about, who had lame horses and weak lambs, they'd come. Be an animal doctor. When the cat's meat man had gone, the parrot flew off the window onto the doctor's table and said, That man's got sense. That's what you ought to do. Be an animal doctor. Give the silly people up. If they haven't brains enough to see you're the best doctor in the world, take care of animals instead. They'll soon find it out. Be an animal doctor. Oh, there are plenty of animal doctors, said John Doolittle, putting the flower pots outside on the windowsill to get the rain. Yes, there are plenty, said Polynesia, but none of them are any good at all. Now listen, doctor, and I'll tell you something. Did you know that animals can talk? I knew that parrots can talk, said the doctor. Oh, we parrots can talk in two languages. People's language and bird language, said Polynesia proudly. If I say, Polly wants a cracker, you understand me. But hear this? Kaka o e fifi? Good gracious, cried the doctor. What does that mean? That means, is the porridge hot yet? In bird language. My, you don't say so, said the doctor. You never talked that way to me before. What would have been the good, said Polynesia, dusting some cracker crumbs off her left wing. You wouldn't have understood me if I had. Tell me some more, said the doctor, all excited. And he rushed over to the dresser drawer and came back with the butcher's book and a pencil. Now don't go too fast, and I'll write it down. This is interesting, very interesting. Something quite new. Give me the birds' A, B, C first, slowly now. So that was the way the doctor came to know that animals had a language of their own and could talk to one another. And all that afternoon, while it was raining, Polynesia sat on the kitchen table, giving him bird words to put down in the book. At tea time, when the dog, Jip, came in, the parrot said to the doctor, See, he's talking to you. Looks to me as though he were scratching his ear, said the doctor. But animals don't always speak with their mouths, said the parrot in a high voice, raising her eyebrows. They talk with their ears, with their feet, with their tails, with everything. Sometimes they don't want to make a noise. Do you see now the way he's twitching up one side of his nose? What's that mean? asked the doctor. That means, can't you see that it has stopped raining? Polynesia answered. He is asking you a question. Dogs nearly always use their noses for asking questions. After a while, with the parrot's help, 
The doctor got to learn the language of the animals so well that he could talk to them himself and understand everything they said. Then he gave up being a people's doctor altogether. As soon as the cat's meat man had told everyone that John Doolittle was going to become an animal doctor, old ladies began to bring him their pet pugs and poodles who had eaten too much cake, and farmers came many miles to show him sick cows and sheep. One day, a plow horse was brought to him, and the poor thing was terribly glad to find a man who could talk in horse language. You know, doctor, said the horse, that vet over the hill knows nothing at all. He has been treating me six weeks now for spavens. What I need is spectacles. I'm going blind in one eye. There's no reason why horses shouldn't wear glasses, the same as people. But that stupid man over the hill never even looked at my eyes. He kept on giving me big pills. I tried to tell him, but he couldn't understand a word of horse language. What I need is spectacles. Of course, of course, said the doctor. I'll get you some at once. I would like a pair like yours, said the horse, only green. They'll keep the sun out of my eyes while I'm plowing the 50-acre field. Certainly, said the doctor. Green ones you shall have. You know, the trouble is, sir, said the plow horse as the doctor opened the front door to let him out. The trouble is that anybody thinks he can doctor animals just because the animals don't complain. As a matter of fact, it takes a much cleverer man to be a really good animal doctor than it does to be a good people's doctor. My farmer's boy thinks he knows all about horses. I wish you could see him. His face is so fat, he looks as though he had no eyes. And he has got as much brain as a potato bug. He tried to put a mustard plaster on me last week. Where did he put it? asked the doctor. Oh, he didn't put it anywhere on me said the horse. He only tried to. I kicked him into the duck pond. Well, well, said the doctor. I'm a pretty quiet creature, as a rule, said the horse. Very patient with people. Don't make much fuss. But it was bad enough to have that vet giving me the wrong medicine. And when that red-faced boy started to monkey with me, I just couldn't bear it anymore. Did you hurt the boy much? asked the doctor. Oh, no, said the horse. I kicked him in the right place. The vet's looking after him now. When will my glasses be ready? I'll have them for you next week, said the doctor. Come in again Tuesday. Good morning. He could see as well as ever. Then John Doolittle got a fine, big pair of green spectacles. And the plow horse stopped going blind in one eye and could see as well as ever. And soon it became a common sight to see farm animals wearing glasses in the country road Puddleby, and a blind horse was a thing unknown. And so it was with all the other animals that were brought to him. As soon as they found that he could talk their language, they told him where the pain was and how they felt. 
and of course, it was easy for him to cure them. They came at once to his house on the edge of the town. Now all these animals went back and told their brothers and friends that there was a doctor in the little house with the big garden who really was a doctor. And whenever any creatures got sick, not only horses and cows and dogs, but all the little things of the fields, like harvest mice and water voles, badgers and bats, they came at once to his house on the edge of the town so that his big garden was nearly always crowded with animals trying to get in to see him. There were so many that came that he had to have special doors made for the different kinds. He wrote horses on the front door, cows on the side door, and sheep on the kitchen door. Each kind of animal had a separate door. Even the mice had a tiny tunnel made for them into the cellar, where they waited patiently in rows for the doctor to come round to them. And so, in a few years' time, every living thing for miles and miles got to know about John Doolittle, M.D. And the birds who flew to other countries in the winter told the animals in foreign lands of the wonderful doctor of Puddleby on the marsh who could understand their talk and help them in their troubles. In this way, he became famous among the animals all over the world, better known even than he had been among the folks of the West Country. And he was happy and liked his life very much. One afternoon, when the doctor was busy writing in a book, Polynesia sat in the window, as she nearly always did, looking out at the leaves blowing about in the garden. Presently, she sighed aloud. What is it, Polynesia? asked the doctor, looking up from his book. I was just thinking, said the parrot, and she went on looking at the leaves. What were you thinking? I was thinking about people said Polynesia. People make me sick. They think they're so wonderful. The world has been going on now for thousands of years, hasn't it? And the only thing in animal language that people have learned to understand is that when a dog wags his tail, he means, I'm glad. It's funny, isn't it? You are the very first man to talk like us. Oh, sometimes people annoy me dreadfully. Such airs they put on, talking about the dumb animals. Dumb. Huh. Why, I knew a macaw once who could say good morning in seven different ways without once opening his mouth. He could talk every language and Greek. An old professor with a gray beard brought him, but he didn't stay. He said the old man didn't talk Greek right, and he couldn't stand listening to him teach the language wrong. I often wonder what's become of him. That bird knew more geography than people will ever know. People. Golly. 
I suppose if people ever learn to fly, like any common hedge sparrow, we shall never hear the end of it. You're a wise old bird, said the doctor. How old are you really? I know that parents and elephants sometimes live to be very, very old. I can never be quite sure of my age, said Polynesia. It's either 185 or 182, but I know that when I first came here from Africa, King Charles was still hiding in the oak tree because I saw him. He looked scared to death. Chapter 3 More Money Troubles And soon now, the doctor began to make money again, and his sister, Sarah, bought a new dress and was happy. Some of the animals who came to see him were so sick that they had to stay at the doctor's house for a week. And when they were getting better, they used to sit in chairs on the lawn. And often even after they got well, they did not want to go away. They liked the doctor and his house so much. And he never had the heart to refuse them when they asked if they could stay with him. So in this way, he went on getting more and more pets. Once, when he was sitting on his garden wall, smoking a pipe in the evening, an Italian organ grinder came round with a monkey on a string. The doctor saw at once that the monkey's collar was too tight and that he was dirty and unhappy. So he took the monkey away from the Italian gave the man a shilling and told him to go. The organ grinder got awfully angry and said that he wanted to keep the monkey. But the doctor told him that if he didn't go away, he would punch him on the nose. John Doolittle was a strong man, though he wasn't very tall. So the Italian went away saying rude things, and the monkey stayed with Dr. Doolittle and had a good home. The other animals in the house called him Chi-Chi, which is a common word in monkey language, meaning ginger. And another time, when the circus came to Puddleby, the crocodile, who had a bad toothache, escaped at night came into the doctor's garden. The doctor talked to him in crocodile language and took him into the house and made his tooth better. But when the crocodile saw what a nice house it was with all the different places for the different kinds of animals, he too wanted to live with the doctor he asked, couldn't he sleep in the fish pond at the bottom of the garden if he promised not to eat the fish? When the circus men came to take him back, he got so wild and savage that he frightened them away. But to everyone in the house, he was always as gentle as a kitten. But now the old ladies grew afraid to send their lap dogs to Dr. Doolittle because of the crocodile. And the farmers wouldn't believe that he would not eat the lambs and sick calves they brought to be cured. So the doctor went to the crocodile and told him he must go back to his circus. But he wept such big tears 
and begged so hard to be allowed to stay that the doctor hadn't the heart to turn him out. 